Thanks for joining us for another bonus content for the TriSafe Conference 2017. Um, I'm here with Dr. Silvia Hurtado, uh, who, who was one of our keynotes, and we want to unpack some of the things that uh, she shared with us today. But we can't pack, unpack everything. That's why we had the conference, so we need you to come. <laughs> so uh, just, just give you a taste test of what the kind of speakers that we bring to our members. So, uh, Dr. Hurtado, um, we see now more than ever higher ed, the landscape in higher ed has become politically and, and raci even racially infused mm -hmm. uh, with all kinds of rhetoric. It's a hotbed now. And um, you know, for for some, this whole idea of political correctness, mm -hmm. safe spaces, sounds to some as if it's coddling. We're actually hurting our students by making it too much of a safe space or a uh, place of belonging. Um, but your research says that belonging does have mm -hmm. an impact on retention and graduation. Um, for someone who might feel that way, how do you square that circle? Well, I think re actually, what you really need to do is think about. Um, you know, we're, we are not trained to handle conflict when it comes to diversity. We are not trained to, to be culturally aware mentors or teachers. And so I think uh, there's another, I would say, movement afoot, and that is really thinking about how do we be more intentional about this so that we can have the important conversations and also make higher ed the place that it really is. It's a place for you know, free exchange of ideas, right? And that doesn't mean, I mean, a lot of them come politically loaded, and if we don't have people trained to actually carry out those conversations, guess what? They result in explosions. Mm -hmm. Or people think that we're trying to protect certain groups. Well, I think we have to think about it not as a safe space, but as a brave space. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do we start creating our... Wow places on campus where we can have open conversations, that's a brave space for people to share even views that might not, the majority may not be willing to hear, uh, but actually feel uh, an opportunity to actually share what they know and also be able to be what I call part of a growth mindset that is understanding that they have a lot to learn. So I think one of them is really thinking through, and we do this with dialogue on college campuses. We do a lot with dialogue and that we, we recognize that we're all gonna have different perspectives and we want those to be authentic. We want authentic engagement. So we try to create those brave spaces for people to share, even share things that may, might be wrong or could be stereotypes, for example. Get them out because you don't want these kinds of issues to explode in the workplace. Mm -hmm. You really want to actually train students to be able to have these conversations. And you need to have faculty and staff that are trained in being able to have these conversations. So it's not coddling. It's an essential skill. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the research has showed that the best paying jobs and the most stable jobs will, will be those that have high social skills and also analytical skills. Mm -hmm. To have high social skills and high analytical skills, best paying jobs, that's part of the research. Amazing. Um, so it's not just so much about diversity of backgrounds, also diversity of uh, intellectual arguments about positions and really coming together. And I love what you said about brave spaces. Mm -hmm. That takes a, a level of intentionality. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that, that some of these results um, can't be by happenstance. You have to be intentional. And we, let's be honest, sometimes the faculty are not there. Mm -hmm. um, even our students are not there. Uh, the staff who, who want to make that happen, they, they're so, um, busy with the day-to-day -day operations. Mm -hmm. um, what Can you say something about the role of mentoring and being intentional with mentoring and how that can be helpful mm -hmm. to, to translate what we want to do with helping our students into students who flourish in these brave spaces? Mm -hmm. That's very important. I think for the longest time, um, mentoring happened with uh, you know mentors who actually mentored mentees that were much like them, that looked like them, mm -hmm. that thought like them. Well, that's not really happening. If you have a very diverse institution and we are seeing increasing diversity, is actually you have to really think about, well, what does it mean to mentor someone who's different? And in fact, a lot of the pioneers went through that experience. But it was more of a kind of survival, uh, mm. <laughs> survival skills yeah. and techniques that got them through. I think nationally also there's uh, there's some more movements about doing being more intentional about coaching for mentoring. What does it mean to be a culturally aware mentor, that means basically you recognize that you have your own backgrounds and experiences that may be distinctly different from the identities of students that you work with, whether they're undergrads or graduate students, 
and really being able to do some mutual sharing and understanding that where you can come to a place where you can understand more about the work that you do because you are not just respectful but appreciative of the assets that both of you bring to the experience and also to what project you're actually working on, whether that's an educational project, whether it's a research project or something else. And we know that faculty play a big role in this and getting them on board with something like that. Uh, we all know that some, some, sometimes there's challenges, not all the time. Well, so for someone who's listening and they might be in a situation where they don't have that faculty support, what will be some of the ways to um, build those bridges for them to kind of create this context for mm -hmm. students? Well, I think one of the things is if you're talking about convincing faculty colleagues or if you're a staff member thinking about working with faculty is, first of all, understand who's going to be an ally. Who's going to be an ally in your work? Who's going to be an ally, an advocate for students? And starting with that educational process is really important. Helping them to understand the identities of the students and also their special needs and also then thinking about how, how what the students bring are actually assets. That they're, you know, whether it's language differences, whether it's the family uh, differences, that kind of thing, that they're able to think about some of what the students bring is assets. Because eventually those are going to actually play out in what professional careers they decide to do and actually those assets they bring with them from their own cultural backgrounds are going to be really important in the future as the workplace is becoming increasingly diverse. So then thinking about how are you going to be part of developing those assets, right? And so I think it's partially uh, talking to faculty about this changing mindset, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes the way you change mindsets, there's a lot of research now, and what I presented today was a lot of the research that backs it. It's not just talk, but it's actually very strong research that's showing significant results when people change their mindsets uh, when teachers change their mindsets, when staff change it, when students change their mindsets, very important. So I think we can actually make a lot of use of the research that's out there, even giving a colleague or a faculty member an article that might be very influential. Um, I've even seen, say, seen some that say they've come to talks and they've actually, for the first time, heard about this research, some of the social science research, and now they're thinking, oh, yeah, I understand how that yeah. plays into what I do. It's almost like talking their language, like you know, they're researching, use research and meet them where they are, mm -hmm. uh, similar to what we do with our students. Now, I wanted, for the final question, I want to shift gears a little bit. Curriculum. Uh, we see the landscape of higher ed in terms of the, the goals of career development, mm -hmm. job readiness. What's the role of opportunity programs in, with career readiness mm -hmm. in the lack of curriculum that's addressing uh, the, the, the realities of job placement for a student. Mm -hmm. uh, what, is, what can opportunity programs do to kind of fill that gap? Because sometimes there's curriculum that hasn't really changed much mm. in at various schools, and they're just kind of going with the same old, same old. I've heard several programs that actually have used some of the research to kind of implement it as part of their program. So understanding the growth mindset, for example, I've seen actually posters around uh, offices that actually show like info, infographics, for example, yeah, showing something about the research that also kind of in a quick way people can get the idea and say, oh, this is what this office is about and this is the way I need to think in the future. Um, so, you know, if you're talking about uh, curriculum change, I mean, there's one component of it is definitely the content. In other words, for example, science, you got to learn the science, right? But what's distinct about thinking about curriculum, it's not just about the content, it's about the pedagogy, mm -hmm. how it gets implemented, how peers are used in a learning environment to advance student learning, active learning. Lots of research on that is showing that students are not only learning more, doing better, they're becoming better scientists, and it's also closing to disparities. I mean, that's like a really great idea. And thinking through then, okay, if that's what the research shows, this is what is important for learning now in, in this day and age, then really providing ways for faculty development and training. Uh, in other words, to give people an opportunity to learn. In other words, apply that growth months mindset to colleagues and faculty about how they might be able to be, start changing what they do. It's always very difficult, obviously, because when you come in, for example, uh, when I started teaching, you know, I was a sage on the stage, and now I'm pretty much a facilitator of learning. And it, actually is better. And there's more that comes up 
and bubbles up. You just have to be more flexible yeah. about how you use that and you, you connect it with the research. So it's actually more intellectually exciting to be mm. able to do, be much more of a facilitator of learning rather than the sage on the stage. Awesome. And uh, can you, I know there's a, the challenges that we're also always facing in higher ed when helping our students, but you mentioned a story that was really helpful about uh, what you saw at a lab and students wearing their jackets. Yeah. Yeah. Can you end us off with uh, why that gave you hope? Sure. Um, I walked into a lab at a broad access institution, that is, they admitted everyone, and it was a freshman spring lab, and I walked in, they were wearing lab coats, they were busily working under the hood, they were asking each other questions, they were on their computers asking the, the instructor questions and moving forward, and I said, how do they know what they do, what to do? And it was actually kind of an intentional uh, revised curriculum where they in introduced students to laboratory techniques and research and all of that. And they were all busily working towards making presentations on original research. They were doing some research on lipids and its impact on a particular disease, uh, lipids or fats. So I was like, wow, how do these freshmen know how to do this? And it's really kind of intentionally planning and having uh, good instructors who are comfortable with this interactive environment. But they also had a peer learning assistant mm -hmm. who kind of stood with the different groups, answered questions, put on a lab coat too when she needed to get in there and do things and then come back. And she was only a sophomore student. Wow. So it was very exciting to see this because um, they were asking questions that maybe even some you know, seniors or graduate students might be asking in the laboratory and so that's exciting because they can see themselves as scientists and they're actually doing scientific work. So we have the curriculum piece, we have the student leadership piece for that sophomore student um, and we have the motivational piece like what that does for a student who's taking on that identity with a lab coat and uh, their background when they originally they might have never thought that it was possible but by using that the physical nature of lab and integrating that being that intentional that's pretty exciting. Yeah. It's very exciting because they could see, who knows, we might have a Nobel laureate. Yes. Uh, or, you know, even if they see themselves being very skilled at lab, we need incredible people working, for example, the biomedical field, even in industry mm -hmm. in labs. And so I think it really gives them an idea of, I can do this work. Yeah. And that's important. Especially for retention and graduation. Um, thanks so much. Welcome. Appreciate it. It was great being here. Thank you.